Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Katie Glenn Bass. I am the research director at the Knight First Amendment Institute. We're really excited about this program and we're excited to have you all with us. I just have a few housekeeping notes before we begin our formal program. The first is if you need the Wi-Fi, it's Riverside Guest and the password is password, all in lowercase. Bathrooms, there's one on this level uh, to the left as you walk out there and then there are more bathrooms one level down in the elevators. I also just want to explain something about the way we do uh, audience questions here. We have two options for you. Um, you'll see behind you on the screen a QR code that you can scan to enter a question via a Google form, and then the moderator will get it at an iPad. You can ask those questions at any point during the conversation, and the moderator can try to work them in as the panelists are discussing. And then later in the discussion, the moderator will ask people, will invite people to come up to a standing mic in the room if you'd prefer to ask your question that way towards the end of the discussion. Um, and with that, I'm going to welcome the Executive Director of the Knight Institute, Jamil Jaffer, to the stage to uh, give some opening remarks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Jamil Jaffer. I'm the Director of the Knight Institute. Welcome to the Knight Institute's Symposium, Regardless of Frontiers. Um, and to those of you who, who were at the photo exhibit last night, welcome, welcome back. So the Knight Institute focuses on issues at the intersection of free speech and new technology. The concern of this particular symposium is on the role that international borders play in regulating, distorting, or suppressing the free exchange of information and ideas. Of course, Borders have always been sites of censorship and surveillance. Detentions and interrogations and searches at the border are nothing new. But as a result of advancing technologies, technologies that are both fortifying and blurring national frontiers, the relationship between borders and the exchange of information has changed. 50 years ago, censorship at the border typically entailed a customs official destroying a shipment of Cuban books or denying a visa to a Belgian Marxist. Versions of those things still happen, but censorship now comes in many other forms as well. U.S. border agents search the laptops and cell phones of journalists, human rights advocates, and others returning from abroad. Visa applicants are required to register their social media handles with the State Department if they want to visit the United States, handing the US government an easy avenue for surveillance of their expressive and associational activities. The Treasury Department bars Americans from speaking and associating with foreigners whom the US government has sanctioned. Congress bars Americans from accessing Chinese social media platforms. And immigrants in the United States sometimes suffer official retaliation for their expressive activities both online and off. In the United States and in many other democracies as well, foreign speech, speech from abroad, is increasingly viewed as a threat. And yet even as the international border is used as an occasion for new forms of surveillance and suppression, the border's value as a shield seems to have eroded dramatically. It was once possible for dissidents persecuted by authoritarian regimes to take refuge in liberal democracies. Today, we see those rights abusing regimes brazenly reaching across national frontiers to intimidate and even eliminate perceived political enemies, including those living in open societies. An industry of spyware manufacturers provides tools that facilitate these transnational attacks. In many ways, the law is struggling to keep up with these digital age threats and challenges. International human rights law protects the exchange of ideas regardless of frontiers, and the First Amendment has been understood to provide that protection too. But there are many unresolved questions about the meaning and scope of that protection, particularly in relation to new technologies that guard and test national borders. It's these questions that we'll be engaging with over the course of the day. Before I turn this over to Professor Mukherjee, I want to thank just a few people 
Uh, first, it's an immense privilege for us to have this group of advocates and researchers and scholars with us today. So thank you to all the symposium participants uh, and particularly to those who contributed papers. This project gave some of us at the Knight Institute the chance to work with Dugan Meyer, Coulter Thomas, and Saira Hussain from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We're grateful to have had that opportunity and to have been able to feature their beautiful, provocative, and unsettling images, which, as you can see, are around you. I also want to thank the Knight Institute staff who did so much to put this event together, particularly Lorraine Kenny, Katie Glenn Bass, Candace White, Adriana Lamarande, Kitty Ahmed, Teddy Weich, and Roni Galoz. Thank you as well to the Knight Institute's supporters, some of whom are listed at the back of the program and a few of whom have joined us today. And finally, thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to be here with you uh, at Riverside Church, which as we say in the program has been for almost a century a venue for the most important conversations about human rights, social justice, and the United States relationship to the rest of the world. Thanks again. Alora, over to you. Thank you so much, Jamil, and thank you all for coming. It's such a privilege and an honor to be here this morning with you all. So we're going to begin the day by considering the First Amendment rights of non-citizens within the borders of the United States. The questions of whether and how the Constitution should be understood to protect the expressive and associational rights of non-citizens inside the United States are bound up with questions about sovereignty, collective self-determination, and the purpose of the First Amendment. What First Amendment rights should non-citizens be understood to have, and what rights do they actually enjoy? What legal frameworks do we need to ensure that the expressive and associational rights of non-citizens in the United States are respected? I'll start by introducing our truly amazing panelists and by asking them a few opening questions. And then I would love for all the folks in the room and folks who are participating online to chime in with questions of your own using either the QR code or for folks in the room by coming up to the mics. So our first panelist is Alina Das. She's a professor of clinical law at NYU, where she co-teaches and co-directs the Immigrant Rights Clinic. She and her clinic students represent immigrants and community organizations in litigation and advocacy to advance immigrants' rights locally as well as nationally. In addition to her teaching, Alina engages in scholarship on deportation and detention issues, particularly at the intersection of immigration and criminal law. Our next panelist is Ahilan Arulanatham. He is a professor from practice and the co-director of the Center for Immigration Law and Policy at UCLA. He has successfully litigated cases involving immigrants' rights, including Franco Gonzalez versus Holder, the first case to establish a federal right to counsel for any group of immigrants, Ramos versus Nielsen, a challenge to the Trump administration's plan to send holders of temporary protected status who had lived in the United States for decades, um, and Fazaga versus FBI, a challenge to the FBI's surveillance of Muslim communities in Southern California on the basis of their religion. Ahilan has argued before the US Supreme Court three times and has testified before the US Congress three times. Prior to joining UCLA, Ahilan was senior counsel at the ACLU in Los Angeles for nearly 20 years. Ahilan has received numerous awards for his groundbreaking work, including being named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow. In other words, he's a recipient of the Genius Grant. Next, we have Genevieve Lakier. She is a professor of law at the University of Chicago School of Law, where she teaches and writes about freedom of speech and the American Constitution. Her work examines the changing meaning of freedom of speech in the United States, the role that legislatures play in safeguarding free speech values, and the fight over freedom of speech on social media platforms. 
Christian Farias rounds out our panel by bringing a perspective from journalism. He's a senior editor at Inquest, which is published by the Harvard Law School's Institute to end mass incarceration. He has written about law and justice issues for the New York Times, the New York Magazine, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, the Nation, and other outlets. He has served as a legal editor with Radio Lab's More Perfect, a podcast about the Supreme Court, and as a legal affairs reporter for the Huffington Post. He has also completed two writing residencies, including one here at the Knight Institute. So let me start out, Alina, by asking you a question. You've done so much extensive advocacy on behalf of non-citizens who've engaged in expressive activities, activities that most of us just assume should be protected by the First Amendment. But a number of your clients have suffered very serious retaliation for engaging in these activities. Can you please start us off by describing one of your clients' experiences and then we would love to hear how current First Amendment doctrine applies to those situations. Sure, well thank you so much, Laura, for that. And thank you to the Knight Institute for bringing us all together. It's really an honor to be here with so many wonderful scholars, advocates, and experts, um, and particularly on this panel, uh, co-collaborators, co-conspirators in this work. Um, so the, the focus of my paper um, and what I contributed to this convening is primarily about the federal government's uh, aggressive legal positions in trying to undermine the First Amendment rights of immigrant activists. Um, and I hope to talk more about the experiences of my clients and why those positions that the government has been taking are wrong as a matter of law. Um, but first, I'd like to focus um, on just underscoring what's really at stake when we talk about these issues. As many of you know, uh, the immigration detention and deportation laws in this country have not fundamentally changed since 1996, when they were made incredibly more harsh by Congress. So I think it's probably safe to say that the only reason that we have had any victories in the immigrant rights movement over the past 30 years, and here I'm talking about things like like deferred action for childhood arrivals, uh, designation of countries for temporary protected status, uh, the passage of sanctuary litigation, uh, sanctuary legislation and welcoming policies, um, and even the occasional victory um, in court on a broad immigrant rights issue. The only reason we have had those victories is because immigrants have been willing to speak out to expose and condemn immigration policies for what they are, even though they are vulnerable to deportation themselves. And they have done so by being leaders in our communities, organizing the rallies and protests, being the plaintiffs in litigation, speaking to the press, being journalists themselves, and taking on all of these roles, despite the fact it puts them in the crosshairs of federal immigration enforcement. Um, and so that's why the, the question that I pose in the paper that I um, submitted for this um, convening is really not academic, and it's, it's quite ominous. You know, do federal immigration officials have the power to arrest, detain, and deport people for their criticism of U.S. immigration policy? And I think the answer, um, from my perspective, should be a clear no. Obviously, the First Amendment prohibits um, government retaliation of protected speech, when you're criticizing immigration policy, as many of my clients have done, you're engaging in political speech on matters of pressing public concern, the US government should not be able to silence its critics by imprisoning and exiling them. Um, but as I describe in my paper and as I've experienced in my work, the government has raised a number of very challenging arguments with significant success on their side to prevent immigrants um, from raising these very claims. And many experts would have said that the battle was already lost in 1999 when the US Supreme Court um, held in Reno versus AADC that immigrants as a general matter do not have a right to bring a selective enforcement claim to challenge their deportation. So thankfully for me, I was not an expert in selective enforcement when I first encountered the issue. Um, it was January of 2018 when immigration officials under the Trump administration uh, arrested two men in New York City, and they transferred them a thousand miles away to a federal immigration prison in Miami, Florida, with plans for their immediate deportation. The agency responsible, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, claimed it was just doing business as usual. It was targeting 
uh, to non-citizens with all deportation orders who are priorities for uh, deportation. Uh, but these two men, Jean Montreville and Ravi Ragbir, were actually leaders of the New Sanctuary Coalition here in New York City. And this is a coalition of faith-based organizations, um, faith leaders, volunteers, congregants dedicated to advancing immigrant rights. Both men had received deportation orders many years ago, but they had subsequently been authorized to remain in the U.S. to live and work here under formal orders of supervision. And both men used that time uh, to help other families who were going through what they had gone through and navigating the immigration system. They became prominent activists um, and organizers in the immigrant rights movement, um, initially through an amazing organization called Families for Freedom, which is when I first met them, and later as leaders of the New Sanctuary Coalition. So from our perspective, what was claimed to be business as usual looked very different. Um, I had been representing Ravi for about a decade when this happened, and unfortunately had a front row seat to many of the things that were unfolding in real time. We were actually in a meeting um, at Judson Memorial Church downtown uh, Manhattan, where New Sanctuary Coalition's offices were located. We were meeting with Ravi to discuss his upcoming supervision appointment uh, with ICE. And that's where we learned that um, Gene had been arrested at his home um, in Queens just before his supervision appointment was scheduled to occur. And at that same time, we began receiving reports that there were suspicious cars outside of the church as we were meeting. Um, I will spare you the story of how I was eight months pregnant at the time and we thought it would be a good idea for me to go knock on the doors of each of the unmarked cars <laughs> to ask them if they were my Uber. Um, but essentially it was becoming clear at the time that these federal immigration officers who had for a long time been expressing to our faces, to the faces of faith leaders and new sanctuary volunteers, how much resentment they had um, over the sanctuary movement and the public attention that Ravi and Jean were receiving, it became clear that they were actually hatching a plan to try to silence Revy and Jean uh, once and for all and to send a broader message to our community that if you speak out against ICE, you or your loved ones will be deported. So we were very grateful during that difficult time um, to have the support of so many partners to help craft a First Amendment strategy, including Arnold and Porter, which eventually led the litigation in Ravi's case, and so many organizations that um, partnered with us as amici, including the Knight Institute. Thank you to Ramya, who um, worked on the amicus briefing and supported our public education strategy. I know we'll be hearing from her later today. Um, we were able to get an amazing Second Circuit decision, which essentially found that um, Revy's case fit in with an exception in Reno versus AADC for outrageous discrimination, which is what they found a claim, a plausible claim that you were being retaliated for your criticism of immigration policy was a form of outrageous discrimination, and that the suspension clause required judicial review despite very bad jurisdiction stripping provisions um, in immigration law. Now this decision was short-lived in the sense that um, the government sought sir, and it was remanded for an intervening suspension clause issue, although not on the merits like the government had asked, so that was good. But on remand, we ended up settling the case, um, and Ravi was able to receive three years of deferred action, and we are continuing um, to fight for his right to stay here in the U.S. Thank you. Um, and <laughs> uh, and it, the, the case itself still um, had the effect of serving as a roadmap for others. Um, Gene had been the one who was arrested first, and he was unfortunately deported to Haiti very quickly after this happened. But fortunately, after the Second Circuit issued its decision, we reached out to him in Haiti, decided to file a First Amendment lawsuit to try and bring him back. And that, too, was ultimately successful as part of a settlement, and he is here in the United States. Um, thank you. <laughs> But unfortunately, Ravi and Jean um, are not alone in their experiences. Um, with our partners, the NYU Immigrant Rights Clinic um, began a mapping project, um, and I encourage you all to visit immigrantrightsvoices.org, which is where we mapped all of the instances of um, retaliation under the Trump administration of immigrant activists, and mapped over 1,000 instances across the country. So that's immigrantrightsvoices.org. Um, I ended up representing several individuals, as many people here have, um, who face this kind of retaliation 
over the years. Um, and because of immigrant organizing, once again, many of these individuals were able to achieve a measure of success through settlements in their cases, um, through other ways of resolving the issues that they were facing. But because of the way these things were resolved, the law itself remains in flux. And I know that this, these positions that the government took, which are essentially that no court can review these cases, and even if they could, immigrants who are subject to otherwise valid immigration enforcement shouldn't be able to raise First Amendment claims at all, those claims are the, still the ones that they continue to raise the Justice Department under the Biden administration. And I know this because I represent someone who was retaliated against, detained, almost deported by the same field office that targeted Revy and Jean under the Biden administration. And they brought in a special individual from the Department of Justice just for the purpose of arguing that there was no judicial review of her claims. And like others, we were able to resolve the case favorably um, by other means, and so it remains to be seen what will happen with the law. Um, so there are responses to these legal arguments, which is what I outline in the paper. And essentially, uh, I hope that we'll be able to talk about them in more detail. Um, the hope is that we can somehow normalize um, First Amendment uh, law and immigration rights in a way, but it is a hard task given how um, immigration exceptionalism applies across all sorts of constitutional domains. And I'm interested in hearing from those who are our core First Amendment scholars whether the First Amendment really do, continues to do its job of, of protecting people who are oppressed rather than the powerful, given some of the shifts we've seen over time. But I think the larger concern is really why our government is so willing um, under any administration to put the interests of immigration enforcement over the interests of defending the Constitution. Um, courts have been willing partners to this, but I hope and I think as lawyers, many of us believe that that course can be corrected over time and that the victory that Revy achieved in the Second Circuit, as fleeting as that decision was, can be an example of what's to come. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alina. It is so inspiring to hear about Ravi, to hear about Jean, to hear that they're back in the United States with their loved ones, and to hear about the awe-inspiring warrior you are for folks, non-citizens, who have had their First Amendment rights violated. So, Ahilan, let's turn now to you. Alina raised so many troubling questions. Why isn't the First Amendment doctrine more protective of the expressive and associational rights of non-citizens within the United States? What legal frameworks do we need to ensure that the rights of non-citizens in the United States are actually respected and that the pattern that Alina has described isn't perpetuated? So, um, <laughs> Thanks for the question. I guess first I should also thank the Knight Institute for organizing this really important discussion uh, and also the, the things from last night. And your work, Alina, really underscores, well, thank you for it. This is incredibly important work and also does underscore the need to have uh, conversations like this. I, mean, I think underneath your question, Elora, I feel like are sort of two distinct questions. Um, and I want to kind of play abstract law professor for a, a minute here, because I think it, it's helpful to, to think about that framework that way. You know, one question is if uh, anyone, a citizen or a non-citizen, wants to assert First Amendment rights as against federal immigration enforcement, which is what the cases you were talking about is about, right? Like, what, what legal frameworks do we need for that? What is the existing law about that? A second, to me, very, very different question is, if we leave aside the federal immigration enforcement context, what are the rights of non-citizens in general uh, when it comes to free speech? And are those different from citizens, the rights of citizens, and should they be? I actually think it's useful to start with that second question just for a minute to escape from immigration exceptionalism and all that in order to think about this. If we're, if we're allowed to sort of think, what's the general legal framework? You know, sort of abstract first principles, what should we think about this? And to me, the answer is quite obvious, actually, if you abstract out of that, that the rights of non-citizens and citizens with respect to speech not only should be the same, but actually are the same in practice in most um, situations outside of federal immigration enforcement. You know, just, just take, imagine, imagine students at a university are protesting a university, just hypothetically, you know, are protesting universities' investment policies with respect to a country somewhere. And you have citizen and non-citizen students who are protesting. 
would it make sense that the school might have two sets of rules? Like the, you know, the citizen students have to be 50 yards away from the president's office, but the non-citizens have to be 100 yards away? Um, or, you know, if you want a less sort of hot example or whatever, you know, imagine a situation where people are protesting at a school board uh, or, or just speaking at a school board meeting to complain about, any, you know, class sizes for their kids or, you know, any sort of mundane, you know, context in which um, First Amendment rights happen all the time. The, the idea that in that kind of context that, the, say, the, the length of time rules for a citizen to speak might be different for a non-citizen to speak, to me seem pretty, I mean, that it seems absurd to me that, that you would imagine kind of different rules in that context because the, the state's interest in creating its time, place, and manner rule or even other kinds of rules, uh, the speaker's interest in, in speaking, and the general kind of public interest or societal interest in structuring the First Amendment rules in that context to ensure what we want the First Amendment, the work that we want the First Amendment to do, they're all the same, regardless of whether the person is a citizen or non-citizen. And so, you know, for me, I think that is the kind of general framework that I would bring to all of this. And I think that intuition holds. You can test it in a variety of contexts. I think that intuition will hold even if the state actor at issue is the federal government. You know, put that protest on a military base or, um, you know, put the school board uh, on federal land or, you know, the protest on federal land. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, and I think it also holds even though it's true that non-citizens, uh, for the most part, can't vote and can't vote in federal elections, you know, ever, because the fact that you can't participate by voting doesn't make it sort of less important that you have the ability to speak to people who can, right? Like, it, that just, it just, it's sort of quite orthogonal uh, to me to the question. So I think, yeah, that, that's sort of my answer to your question as a general matter from a legal framework perspective. I think the First Amendment's protections to, as to speech should be treated like the Sixth Amendment's protections, which apply in all criminal cases and are meant to be the same regardless of immigration status. I think it should be the same as the suspension clause. You know, important caveats we have to talk about, but the, but the, the, first, the suspension clause and the federal habeas statute, which is uh, meant to implement it, apply to all prisoners. And um, you know, at least when it comes to a sort of canonical claim challenging your detention, those are the same and are, are to be treated the same regardless of the immigration status of the, of the prisoner. And I think the First Amendment should be like that. You know, now, the, the contrary view, uh, in the doctrine anyway, and in the kind of academic discussion about this, seems to arise from the fact that the First Amendment uses the word the people um, in, in, a, in a portion of it. And so the, and the idea there is the people refers to a political community, and the, the people protected by the political community that are defined in, the, in that um, language might be more limited than the set of all people, like natural persons, who are just living and walking around in the territory of the United States. Um, now, you know, I, I don't want to get into this in a lot of detail. A lot of people have written about this. Pradeep Ngulasekaram is one professor who's written really interesting stuff about this. I think that view is clearly wrong. Um, for one thing, the text says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble. So the people is not about the speech clause, it's about the assembly clause, and just a sort of very basic grammatical, re if, you, if, you, if you wanna read the people back into that, it's just a very unnatural reading of the words. Presumably then you would read it back into the press, which is even weirder, uh, like citizen press and non-citizen press. It was just totally bizarre, it doesn't make much sense. Um, and I also think it's true that it's odd to me that we would pick this one spot to read the First Amendment in this distinctly, textually limited way when Congress doesn't actually mean Congress, it applies to all branches of government. Um, you know, speech doesn't just mean speech, it applies to expressive conduct that's not speech and applied to listening, which, you know, is coming in the papers, you know, later. Um, and law doesn't apply to laws, but also to regulations and to just enforcement action that isn't law. So it's like, the First Amendment is so far uh, outside its narrow text, you know, by its terms. It's just, why in this one context would we instead limit it back to a phrase that's not even in the portion of the amendment which is about speech. So I, I think there are, yeah, are really serious problems just at a very basic level with the doctrinal move of trying to limit speech rights based on the text of the amendment. Um, so you know, if, if you're with me with all there, then really the question uh, now I would say like comes back to um, you know, uh, Alina's question, which is like, okay, given that in general, 
It doesn't make any sense doctrinally um, uh, or in terms of the text or uh, you know, the sort of normal things that we consider in constitutional analysis to limit f speech rights to, uh, non or, or for non-citizens in a way that does not apply to citizens. Is there some reason why we should nonetheless allow those things in the context of immigration enforcement? Um, and that's sort of the classic immigration exceptionalism move, like you're talking about, you know, maybe all the rights, due process rights, uh, everything is sort of limited when it comes to asserting rights against immigration enforcement. And, you know, I, I don't want to kind of get into it in a lot of detail. This also a lot of people um, have written about, um, including Adam, Adam Cox, who's here, who just wrote a, a, a very long paper about this, uh, talking about the problems of immigration exceptionalism. A lot of people have talked about this in different contexts. I would just say, like, Three things, quick things. You know, it's my view that uh, you know those are wrong, uh, and that, that there isn't a, an immigration exceptionalist sort of justification for treating the First Amendment uh, differently when it comes to immigration enforcement. I think that you can believe that, and nonetheless believe that the government has the power to exclude and deport and detain people. It may or may not have that those powers. It's a much more complica complicated sort of question. But even if it does, all it means to reject immigration exceptionalism in this context is just to say that those powers, when exercised, are constrained by the First Amendment. Just like when the government does a million other things, like exercise its Commerce Clause power, or exercise its spending power, or every other, you know, that there's a side constraint operating on those exercises, which is the First Amendment. And that is to say that the government can still deport people, but it can't do it for reasons that would be uh, impermissible as applied to other kinds of sanctions. So, you know, if you can't criminally prosecute somebody for a speech, then you shouldn't be able to deport them for a speech either. Of course, you can criminally prosecute for some speech if it complies with the Brandenburg test, or, and then you could deport on that basis too. But if you can't do the one, then you can't do the other. So I don't think it's sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't get you to like open borders just because you believe that there's no, you know, immigrant, um, immigration exceptionalism. The other thing I would say, um, or two other things I would say, unlike in some other areas, the Supreme Court has not said that non-citizens have fewer First Amendment rights. You know, it's the orthodoxy, I think, even in, in, even in the context of immigration enforcement, it is the orthodoxy, for sure, that's what most people think, and I think um, most people think that the Supreme Court has said that as well, um, but actually, I think if you look at the cases, only a few cases, but if you look at the cases closely, most of them are either cases that would have come out the same way even if the person was not an immigrant because uh, of the time that they were decided. I'm thinking of like Turner v. Williams, which is from like early 1900s, or these cases from the Cold, Cold War communist era like Carlson v. Landon and Heresiades. These are cases where it decided at a time when the First Amendment doctrine generally was really different from what it is now. Um, and then ADC, and this sort of gets to the third point I was saying, um, uh, ADC is primarily a case about, not, not primarily, I would argue it's entirely a case about selective enforcement. And I mean, what makes your work so amazing is that the people Alina was representing were all people who had final deportation orders. And she was arguing that even though they had a final deportation order, still the government could not target them for deportation. Um, and, and whether or not such an argument uh, would work today with our current Supreme Court, it's a very, very different thing to say that if you take people who are lawfully present but are non-citizens, like my temporary protected status holder clients, for example, who went all around the country vigorously organizing and protesting and demonstrating and hunger striking to protect TPS status, that those people can be targeted for their speech where they're not actually deportable. They're holders of lawful status. And to argue that nonetheless the government will strip that status because of their speech is a very, very different thing. And the Supreme Court has never said that's okay. Um, and, and I think to do that would be a bridge farther. They may do it, but to do it would be a bridge farther. So I think, I think uh, for all those reasons, I would say you know, the, the, the framework that we're talking about is actually more expansive, properly understood, under even existing law, than people sort of often assume it is. Thank you so much, Ahilan. There are so many important insights that we all should take from that discussion, including about how the First Amendment must be a bulwark against immigration exceptionalism in this area. And you ended your talk in part by mentioning the orthodoxy around the First Amendment interpretation in this area. So Genevieve, that's the perfect spot for you to come in. Tell us about this orthodoxy. What 
why do we have this limited understanding of the First Amendment rights afforded to immigrants? What does that tell us about the strength and nature of the First Amendment more broadly? We're accustomed to thinking of free speech protection so as so broad and so powerful in areas that do not include immigrants, but is that really what it is? All right, well, thank you, and thank you uh, for having me, and uh, it's great to be on this panel. I'm so happy this convening is uh, occurring. And Anilan, I'm so happy that you just set me up perfectly because <laughs> I have to say I agree, and I guess I disagree a little bit with your presentation because I think as a matter of theory, as a matter of doctrinal theory, so the conception of the first of free speech uh, in the cases, it seems I completely agree with you that there is a very strong argument to be made that non-citizens who are in the United States, or I think we could even speak more broadly, non-citizens who are addressing a US audience, that speech should be entitled to full First Amendment protection under the sort of the orthodox view of what and how broadly the First Amendment extends. Because from the 1930s, 1940s, the court has made very clear that the First Amendment protects all speech that addresses publicly and truthfully speech on matters of public concern that is relevant to the interests of the listening public. And it pr protects the speech not only for the speaker's benefit, not only because we think that speaker is a rights holder, um, but because of the audience. The members of the democratic polity have a right to have access to the widest, you know, in a later case, uh, the court talks about the most robust and inclusive uh, public discussion available. They have the right to all, um, a, a wide range of viewpoints and ideas. And presumably, <laughs> that means, if we're not going to be ridiculously um, parochial, means maybe that foreigners, non-US citizens, uh, whether living here or not living here, but particularly living here, might have something to add to democratic public discussion. And so from a theoretical perspective, from like 1940 on, the argument that, um, as you say, non-citizen speakers and non-citizen speech should be on a par with citizen speech, um, it's, it's obvious, right? Like it, it, it's, the, it's the logical conclusion. And yet I think if you look at the history of the First Amendment law, what you see is a constant battle with a suspicion about foreign speakers in the United States and a worry about the way in which foreign ideas are subverting and undermining the American experiment or democratic principles. I mean, if, I think it is no um, coincidence that many of the defendants in the early Espionage uh, Act cases out of which emerges the early First Amendment are non um, so, for example, in the Frower case that Holmes decides in 1919, it's a German language publication in the very infamous uh, Schenck for the United States, there are uh, Russian immigrants. And, you know, as we know, much of the um, anxiety and opposition to the anti-war sentiments from World War I that um, uh, generated, mobilized the development of the modern First Amendment was xenophobia, was a concern about radical immigrants from Eastern Europe um, bringing in their proletarian ideas and revolutionary aims. Um, and the court rejects this ultimately uh, by declaring that the First Amendment extends broadly, the First Amendment um, allows uh, speakers to engage in un-American speech so long as it is on matters of public concern and is addressing and contributing to this uh, vibrant public discourse. Uh, and then we get the second Red Scare and we get the Dennis case. And again, a huge part of Dennis, Dennis involves the prosecution of the leaders of the Communist Party USA, so these are American citizens, but so much of the concern in the opinions and the arguments is about the subversion uh, by the Soviet Union, this subterranean infiltration of the American experiment by this foreign uh, global power, and the need to protect against that. And it is in the response to that that we see the Supreme Court allow the conviction um, of members of a political party basically for spreading political philosophy. And then the court rejects that, right? Dennis becomes this um, stain on the history of the First Amendment and out of, in response to Dennis, the court begins to embrace a much more rigid, um, expansive, um, some have said imperial First Amendment uh, beginning in the late 1960s, 1970s, we begin to see a much more expansive and aggressive um, um, and no balancing, uh, no conditions, we, free speech, we really mean it. And yet still, I guess the part where I disagree with you is that I think as a matter of actual descriptive practice, it's not obvious to me that it is only in the immigration context that non-citizens have fewer speech rights as a practical matter. We also know when it comes to election-related speech and campaign finance, the distinction between citizen and non-citizen is a significant one. And although the Supreme Court has never ruled on it, uh, then Judge Kavanaugh, when he was sitting in the DC Circuit, wrote an important and influential opinion in Blumen v. FEC, in which he quite forthrightly articulates a view that non-US citizens, 
oh, oh, non-resident, uh, non-permanent residents, right? He's not. It is very interesting to me the ways in which these um, categories shift. So maybe it's about citizenship, maybe it's about permanent status, but there's some category of resident aliens who, on Kavanaugh's view, do not have the same right to participate in democratic election-related or political con uh, discourse, or certainly not to fund it um, uh, under existing uh, doctrine, which um, is a significant um, reduction in free speech rights, particularly in a time when, and on a court, when being able to contribute money to political campaigns is a, understood as a very significant means of expressing and participating in uh, the political process. So, uh, I, I, for me, it creates this paradox or this conundrum or this really important question that I'm, I'm glad we're all gathering in a way to discuss today, which is if, in theory, the argument that non-citizens should have full First Amendment rights is crystal clear and very old, almost 100 years old, the court has um, settled on the doctrine that it's really about the, is it speech on matters of public concern? Is it addressing uh, a public audience? Uh, that's all you need to know. And then the reality of significant uh, differences in the quality and nature of our rights. Um, Anila is completely right that non-US citizen speakers have a lot of First Amendment rights, but maybe not where it counts, or maybe not in the context where it really matters. And so how do we understand this? How do we understand, on the one hand, this expansive um, theory and this uh, uh, limited uh, application? And I guess I'm just gonna make the paradox a little bit sharper because you know, if we think that there are certain characteristics of the modern, since I, which I, um, I group from the 1970s on, the modern doctrinal framework when we're thinking about the First Amendment, the court has emphasized in recent years two principles of how the modern First Amendment works that are supposed to guard against government discrimination and tyranny and all the bad stuff that are central to the modern First Amendment. One is no speaker-based distinctions. Um, certainly not when there are pretexts for viewpoint-based uh, distinctions. You know, in maybe the peak of the modern libertarian or laissez-faire First Amendment, the peak case, Citizens United, one of the most hated cases, but also an extremely expansive, very First Amendment-y case, um, justice, uh, the court strongly rejects the idea that we should think that speaker-based distinctions are okay in any context in where they might be a proxy for viewpoint discrimination, which is certainly in these contexts that Alina is talking about. And second, the court has made this idea that what the First Amendment prohibits above all else, perhaps, is a viewpoint discrimination by the government, sort of a central mantra in how we think about the First Amendment. What the First Amendment does not allow the government to do above all other things is discriminate against people based on their viewpoint. And yet again, that is exactly what Alina is describing the government saying that it has the right to do. And so there is a way in which the current dichotomy the actual practice of or the reality of how the First Amendment works in the immigration context, maybe also in the campaign finance context, maybe in other contexts when it comes to non-US citizens, um, is in direct tension with what the court has articulated as the central and very strong um, uh, principles of the modern First Amendment. And so how do we understand this? And I think there are two, three explanations, and I think they're important, um, but I'm not sure. I, like, I think it's, a gen it's genuinely interesting the ways in which the modern First Amendment is in some ways so expansive and then in some ways so narrow and so limited. You know, First Amendment scholars today like to um, complain about how broad and how overly expansive, how too t deregulatory the First Amendment is, but uh, I'm sure that's not your yeah, <laughs> experience. In many ways, it's very, very narrow. Um, okay, so I think there's three, just, uh, three reasons why. So one is, um, the conception of democracy that underlies it. The idea that um, Kavanaugh articulated in his opinion in Blumen, but I think that underpins uh, and explains why even in Citizens United, even like a few paragraphs after saying that speaker-based distinctions are never allowed in the First Amendment, certainly not when they're proxy for viewpoint discrimination, uh, the court says, oh, but you know, bans on foreign-owned corporations being able to participate in elections. Well, that's fine, without really any explanation. How these two can go together is this view that the reason we're protecting so much speech and we're tying the government's hands when it comes to regulating um, speech, including corporate speech, is because of an idea that this is speech by and for the democratic polis. And I think this is not so much a textless claim about who, you know, the people, but an idea that um, democracy only works if it is the members of the political community who are calling the shots. And so we are really only protecting speech, potentially, to the extent that it is contributing to the um, conversation by and between and among members of the democratic community. And that foreign speakers can contribute, but they can also subvert the autonomy of the democratic people, their ability to participate in um, self-governance in this core way. 
And I, I think that's influencing a lot of it. Now, um, I think it's incoherent in a certain extent, which is why it's always nuanced and unsure of itself. Um, I think, again, the Blumen opinion is so interesting because Kavanaugh does not say non-US citizens or non-permanent uh, residents do not have any First Amendment rights or any right to speak, but they don't have a right to contribute money to elections because that is where the, the opinion draws the line between giving useful ideas and opinions and um, exerting too much power of the democratic polity. And so it's always unsure there are uh, limits. The, the view is not that non-citizens don't have any free speech rights, but that the democratic political community, the native born, the citizens, whoever we may think it to be in our conception of democracy, must have control um, over the terms and conditions under which they are governed. Now, I think that's incoherent though, because what it produces is the kind of situation that Alina was talking about, where we have a largely unaccountable federal bureaucracy making decisions on the basis of viewpoint-based reasons in a way that I think is uh, inconsistent with the democratic principles that we're supposed to be defending, which is that the government in a democratic society may not act for viewpoint discriminatory reasons when it regulates people or speech. And so uh, I'm not sure the view works, but I do think to the extent that there is gonna be movement on the First Amendment status of non-citizens and non-permanent resident speech, there is gonna to have to be um, argument about what democracy means and what it means for the rights of non-US uh, citizens. Second, and this is part, this is, I think, uh, the story about non-citizen rights is part of a larger story, which is that even as the court has in some ways articulated a very expansive First Amendment, it is a First Amendment that is very subservient or very sensitive to, very deferential to the needs of prosecutors. Um, Alina, you talk in your paper about the prosecutorial discretion cases or the Neves case and the, the one, this, uh, the Gonzalo v. Trevino case, where the court um, uh, uh, clearly doesn't want to read the First Amendment as too much of an intrusion on the discretionary authority of the coercive agents of the state, the police. And there is a way in which the modern First Amendment, even, how, even as it uh, articulates a sort of a kind of imperial and expansive vision of what counts as speech and how broadly the First Amendment applies so that First Amendment law starts swallowing up more and more law, also tends to be very deferential to the needs of regulators and particularly the, those who maintain security, whether it's domestic security or national security. Um, and I think this is also a front on which if there is to be any movement on the rights of non-citizens and on immigration exceptionalism, I think it's part of a broader critique that has to be made from within um, and uh, beyond the First Amendment about um, why, why it is the case and why it should not be the case that the um, civil rights of both um, uh, the free speech and other civil rights do not need to take this backseat to prosecutorial discretion. And third, I think also uh, uh, the, the government speech doctrine and the court's uh, receptivity to the idea that, well, government, a democratic government can viewpoint discriminate when it is articulating its own programs and its own policies. There's a way in which, despite saying viewpoint discrimination is always anathema in the First Amendment, the modern f doctrine allows, as a practical matter, an enormous amount of viewpoint discrimination on the government's part. And so there's a way in which the stories we are talking about here today are part of a broader kind of domestication no pun intended, of the First Amendment to make it powerful in certain ways and very, very deferential to government power in others. And to make it, I think, in, in general, um, a tool that it can be used in uh, very powerfully to strike down certain kinds of laws, those perhaps that constrain and interfere with the operation of certain kinds of markets, uh, but that do not fundamentally challenge the ability of the government to maintain what it considers its version of security. And that idea that First Amendment rights have to always give way in the interests of security, whatever that may look like and however they may operate, I think is a fundamental problem, but it's a fundamental challenge in this area. Thank you so much, Genevieve. So both Genevieve and Ahilan raised questions about who are the people. And Christian, that's where I want to turn to you. Let's talk about the preamble to the Constitution, which begins with the language, we the people. Are immigrants, including undocumented immigrants, included in the we the people language? You've recently published a piece about originalism. So what would originalists say in response to that question? Who should be answering this question? Do we trust the US Supreme Court to answer this question? 
And where are your views on this? Thank you, Alora. Thank you to all the panelists. I'm excited to be back at Columbia. Uh, it, it, I was a writer in residence here uh, a few years ago. And I actually followed up on a lot of the cases that Alina was talking about and Ahilan as well. And I am really uh, heartened to see where these cases have gone and how they've been resolved. One problem with journalism, and I'm a journalist, I'm not a legal scholar, is that once we report on something and we publish the piece, we kind of step out and we don't follow up on the cases. That's a big failing of journalism. Um, but you guys do the hard work and you guys see these cases through to the very end, so thank you for that and for, and for informing me on, on where these cases stand today. Also, I should note that uh, please, uh, I will not give you a dissertation on these legal principles with uh, the verb and knowledge that the other panelists have. But I do follow trends. I do follow the courts. I do look at the Supreme Court very closely, what it does, what it doesn't do. Uh, and I can give you kind of uh, the bird's eye view of where things are at the moment. And as Laura was saying, uh, I... Uh, I'm not an originalist, I'm not an expert in originalism, but I do follow what the current court does with these topics and these subjects. And as you may know, even though this is not a Second Amendment talk, this is a First Amendment talk, the Supreme Court is very much engaged in this project of what the people means because of its interest in the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Uh, you know, as you know, that right according to Heller, protects the people, the people's right to bear arms. And there's an open question in the courts right now whether that language covers undocumented immigrants. Uh, right now, the Justice Department, as a result of Bruin, uh, the Second Amendment decision that basically uh, now mandates judges to uh, engage in a historical analysis of gun regulations to ensure whether or not they comport with uh, with how regulations were at the founding, uh, you know, now has judges basically going crazy, becoming historians uh, on gun regulations. And, and one regulation in particular, one gun law that uh, is, has come up because federal public defenders are challenging it in court is whether the undocumented or the non-citizen ban on the possession of a weapon under federal law is constitutional under Bruin, uh, and of course, federal public defenders, they defend many non-citizens uh, who are facing these gun charges. Uh, and, and the Justice Department now finds itself in a very interesting position because these are criminal, criminal cases. So far, we've talked about civil litigation, and, and criminal lawyers, uh, you know, they have a way of litigating things. I don't know to what extent. I would love to be a fly on the wall of those conversations of how uh, the civil division, which handles a lot of these weighty constitutional issues, is informing the criminal lawyers and the prosecutors on how to, how to defend these cases. Uh, but right now, that's what the courts are, 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 trying to, are trying to determine, whether the people covers these non-citizens who happen to be, uh, if not gun owners, they definitely have been found to possess firearms, which subjects them to incarceration, prosecution, and obviously after that, deportation. And, and this is not an academic question, uh, just uh, speaking of what the people means. Uh, over the summer after the Supreme Court tried to once again clarify what the Second Amendment means, uh, the Fifth Circuit, in a, in a case very much raising this issue, said point blank, well, the Supreme Court hasn't clarified this issue, neither will we. We're just going to follow our own precedent and we're going to say that non-citizens are not, quote, members of the political community. You know, so what does that mean that non-citizens are not members of a political community? Is that historically based? Is that grounded in any particular theory or understanding of the Constitution? Who were the part of, who were part of the political community at the founding uh, when this nation first got started? Um, no one knows, but there, there's been scholarship. There's people way smarter than me who have written on this, who have said, hey, look, why are we even bothering with 
whether or not undocumented immigrants were, were uh, covered by the people language at the founding. Of course they weren't. There were no immigration laws at the time. <laughs> if anything, the, the, we were trying to build a nation. There were lots of immigrants coming. Uh, people wanted to kind of, you know, settle and, and kind of start their own communities. Of course we were, made, we were a nation of immigrants, uh, and, and everyone is included in this language. That's what the scholars are saying. But now, if this question comes to the current Supreme Court, how are they going to answer the question? Uh, and, and that matters because of the reasons that have been already explained, that once the Supreme Court answers whether the people covers non-citizens, that applies to the First Amendment too, because the people is in the First Amendment. It applies in the Fourth Amendment context, because the words the people are also in the Fourth Amendment. So if you have this broad pronouncement, this, and I'm dreading the historical analysis that the Supreme Court will do if and when this gets there, uh, will they want to answer the question? Because if they do, that could have really, really strong ramifications uh, for these other areas of the law. And, and honestly, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and as a journalist, I'm just following the litigation. But the reality is that uh, judges are not happy with the status quo uh, of the Second Amendment law, uh, and, and, and because they're having trouble even applying the instructions that the Supreme Court is giving them, now uh, they're all over the place, and because they're all over the place, uh, circuit splits are bound to develop, and the Supreme Court, sooner rather than later, is going to have to uh, answer the question, and, and, and honestly, I'm among the skeptics who doesn't trust the Supreme Court to answer it correctly. In a way, I hope they don't, uh, because uh, as we've seen in other contexts, you know, they, 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 I mean, uh, Ahilan wrote a great piece uh, about Munoz a couple months ago, which is another immigration case that they decided. They, they just apply their own view of, of, of what the text of the Constitution means very selectively, depending on who the claimant or who the plaintiff or who the defendant is. And, and, you know, and, and the reality is, is I'm, I'm just very, very, very worried about what the final answer will be in this context. Christian, thank you so much for all of those insights. And thank you to everyone in the audience who has started sending in questions using the QR code. Feel free to keep those questions coming. I really appreciate it. So I'm going to kick us off with a question that's on my mind and clearly has been on the mind of one other audience member. Let's look forward. There are only 18 days left until the presidential election. What do you expect will remain stable in this area of law? What do you expect will change? What advocacy strategies might we collectively use under a Harris administration versus a Trump administration? And one of the audience members asked about Trump's plan to target immigrants in large numbers as a key priority. In that context, how can the First Amendment be used as a defense? Um, so thank you for that question. Thank you to the audience member who raised it as well. Um, it's, a, it's a really tough one because I think immigrant rights activists and advocates have been contingency planning for a very long time. Uh, and, and I think it, it is quite alarming, frankly, under either administration. Um, with a, a new Trump administration, I think it's, it's very clear that at least some of the policies of the past will return. And, and we did see not um, kind of an effective mass deportation strategy. Frankly, there have been more deportations, or at least in, with respect to removals under both Biden and Obama than there were under Trump. But what he did uh, so effectively, Trump, is essentially have a kind of a chaos strategy of, and I think that's in part why so many immigrant rights leaders were targeted, because it was a PR strategy. It's a way of creating a chilling effect, exactly what the First Amendment is supposed to uh, protect against um, across immigrant rights organizing overall. And so in that sense, um, I do think communities do need a strategy. Um, of being able to both um, marshal the kind of attention that they need to their leaders to be present for these interactions with ICE, 
Um, a lot of the, frankly, the evidence that we haven't talked about that, but what you need to prove a First Amendment retaliation claim requires there being a presence, not just, um, you know, a federal government says we did it for this reason, we're claiming that, and there's no proof of what's happening. The retaliation claims have to be established. Um, and then this fight in the courts to be very consistent in our arguments to push back against particularly jurisdiction stripping um, issues, which will be significant. Um, so I think it's coordination between activists um, and, uh, and journalists and, um, and those of us who uh, would have to litigate these uh, claims. With the Harris administration, I would expect they would continue, and, and because of organizing and advocacy and what people were able to put forward, the Biden administration did put in some of their prosecutorial discretion memos a line about you know, not tolerating um, retaliation based on First Amendment protective activities. So that's kind of their official policy position. But we see that it still happens. And it happens to the most vulnerable people, people who could, in theory, be picked up because they have an old deportation order. Um, people in detention, this is a huge issue. People have been organizing in immigration detention for as long as we've had immigration detention. We don't know anything about what's happening inside unless we can hear about what's happening inside from them. Um, and the, the retaliation that's going on currently, again, we've seen it in New York City and the surrounding area of retaliation against our community members in Orange County Jail um, who were transferred after a hunger strike, again, happening under the Biden administration. So I think those cases of retaliation will still continue, perhaps not on the scale. And we have to be cognizant both about our arguments about slippage in like criminal law enforcement because that affects us as well. Um, and then I am very scared about the issue um, that Christian has written about um, and everyone should read his, his piece because I do think it's going to keep popping up in these different contexts. And even though I completely agree um, with Ahilan that there are very good reasons to say that whatever we do with the people shouldn't attach itself to free speech based on the clause, um, I think it, it very much maps the actual public dialogue. It, you know, it's all a cycle because immigrants' uh, voices are being suppressed and we are hearing a powerful anti-immigrant rhetoric from many political leaders on the right and left. Um, I think this idea that immigrants, people who've lived in this country for decades, are not part of the people is very much reflected in public discourse. And so that is a place where a single court statement, um, even if it is something that can be narrowed, will, I think, galvanize that sentiment. So we, we have to protect against that in our speech. I think that has to be something that as part of our activism and advocacy, we push against um, and so that the courts, we, we have a counterweight to what could be happening in the courts. And just to add quickly to what Alina just said, uh, uh, inquest.org, which is the publication that I, uh, I'm an editor at, we actually just published a piece precisely about what you said, that there's a lot of anxiety in the immigrant rights advocate community. For whatever the outcome of the election is, this is not a Trump thing. This is also a Harris thing. And, and there's a lot of the, the quote that they, the writer uses, Silky Shah of Detention Watch Network, the, the word is they're doing a lot of scenario planning, really preparing for the worst. And, and in that environment, uh, you know, one thing that Silky says in her piece is that uh, we need to be very mindful to not get caught up in language or narratives around national security or around public safety because historically these narratives that certain immigrants are a threat to you know people that there's criminals in the streets that are you know doing terrible things to Americans or that certain immigrants are national security threats you, you tend to put people into categories into buckets and when you do that you dehumanize some at the expense of others and when you get into those binaries is when you start passing terrible policies and you start kind of uh, folding to uh, what some in the political spectrum want which is for you to uh, make decisions, pass policies based on fear, based on feeling, rather than, you know, just evidence and what's real and, 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 and the truth, you know. So uh, uh, I would encourage people who are wondering what can I do in, in this environment, not knowing what's going to happen, is one, don't fall prey to those narratives and, and be discerning in when you hear politicians talk about it. 
And if you care about immigrant rights, uh, support these organizations because they're going to need it for sure once wh whoever wins the election. Just on a quick note, um, uh, people should find Abe Paulus, who's sitting right there um, with Baji Black Alliance for Just Immigration, because just one of the forefront leaders um, that needs support uh, in this movement fight. So just wanted to point that out. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Hilan, Genevieve, do you want to chime in on this question? Um, I mean, I agree with um, you know, uh, what's been said. I think part of the reason I wanted to draw that distinction between um, people who already have deportation orders, um, and I would put also into that category people who are entirely undocumented, um, like a lot of the students that I represent in the University of California right now, and people who do have status, although they're non-citizens, is because I think that really matters in a very practical way operationally on the ground and would particularly matter if there's um, massive protest activity against, say, a mass deportation campaign by the Trump administration. Because while I do think it's important to, uh, to be appropriately fearful, uh, it's also really important to be calibrated in how we think about that. And, you know, it's, it's really different. I mean, it, it, legally, it is really, really different uh, if you are somebody who already has a removal order or even somebody who's undocumented and has no sort of obvious uh, sort of legal defense, um, to, as opposed to if you're somebody who has a status. Um, and then the, the other thing I would, so, so, and yeah, so I, that's something I definitely keep in mind. Um, uh, there's 1.5 1, 1 million TPS holders in this country now. I think there's around, I can't remember the total number of parolees, but there's a huge number of people who are here on um, uh, paroles of different kinds. And the government can't probably, I think, uh, sort of categorically terminate either of those off schedule. You know, there's a, there's a schedule that, that they sort of have to follow, certainly for TPS. Um, and until they do that, those people are lawfully present and can't be deported for their speech under current law. Like, that's the current law, you know. Uh, and the court would have to change that. They, not to say that they wouldn't, but they would have to change that in order to, in order to do that. The other thing I would say is there's a lot of people in these liminal statuses in uh, immigration law. You know, the, um, I know you, you, you all know this well, but some who may not be as familiar with immigration law, there's, it's not like you're either legal or not legal. Um, and you see that not just in the campaign uh, finance uh, context, this context of US, concept of US persons in Blumen is sort of borrowed from FISA and other kinds of ideas, but even deferred action, like DACA means you're undocumented but the government has decided that they won't deport you for a certain time period and will give you a work authorization. Like, what is that? You know, and, and there's no like legal, illegal definition in the immigration code where you, you're either this or that. So one thing I think that the Trump administration, a future Trump administration could potentially do is try to move a lot of people from one bucket to the other or test the limits of how this First Amendment doctrine intersects with these kinds of various forms of liminal statuses. And that's an area, I think, of, of doctrinal concern and also very real practical concern. Because certainly DACA holders, just to take one example, have you know, lived here uh, with lawful status and employment authorization in very large numbers since now for, for more than a decade. Uh, and, but, but whether they are situated like green card holders or even TPS holders who have a statutory basis for their um, status or instead they're more like, you know, uh, Jean or um, uh, Montreville or Ravi Ragbir, like Alina's clients, is kind of unclear. Uh, and, and that's definitely an, an area of, of something to watch and, and I think in my view be very concerned about in a potential Trump administration. I guess the only thing I'd add, and this is just at the level of ideology or discourse, is that one thing that struck me about particularly the way in which the Trump and Vance talk about why they want mass deportation or the very strong anti-immigrant sentiment that they've been mobilizing is that, well, it's not that they hate immigrants, they just want to prioritize Americans, you know? It's just like, you know, those Democrats, they're just worrying about other people, but we're worrying about our people. And I think when it comes to the First Amendment and when it comes to things like retaliation against people who are criticizing uh, the immigration practices of the current government, like I think it's very important to push back against that. Like re restricting the ability of people to, to criticize the government uh, affects us all. And the problem with this effort to divide between the rights of us and the rights of them is to ignore the ways in which our rights are uh, coexistent. 
And um, so particularly when it comes to speech, <laughs> which is supposed to inform and enable all of us to participate in this shared project, it just seems very important to push back. You cannot deny the rights to those without denying the rights to us to hear what they have to say, uh, just as a, at the discursive level. Thank you. So we just have a few minutes left on this panel. I'd love for you to introduce yourself and ask your question. There are a number of other questions that have come in the chat, so I will ask the most controversial one in addition to your question, and then we'll let you all close. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Lev Citrin, and there are two things that I've heard here, one of which I know for a fact to be untrue, and the other one that completely puzzled me. So the one that's not true uh, I think slipped in in uh, Genevieve's talk where it seems to me that she assumed that non-citizens or citizens uh, free speech is protected and has the widest possible in, uh, application and I assure you that this is not true because I myself had a case I've tried to publish my own book and I've discovered that the government blocks author published books from the mainstream marketplace of ideas, libraries uh, bookstores only giving those to the corporate books. So the proper distinction, it seems to me, is between corporate speech and individual speech, and government tries to suppress individual speech and to facilitate corporate speech. And what puzzled me was uh, in Alina's talk where she linked free speech with immigration, and I kind of thought, look, uh, suppose there is a murder, and a person comes forward and says, I'm the murderer. And the government comes and arrests him. And the person says, wait a minute, I was just ex executing, uh, exercising my free speech rights. And the government says, well, but we are not arresting you for your free speech rights, we're arresting you for murder. And the same thing, um, I, I just couldn't understand the logic. I mean, I understand that law, lawyers are very smart people and that they can link things that are not really mixable, but in any event here, you know, where the, uh, a person is in the country illegally and says, I'm in the country illegally, kind of sticks out his, his head and the government says, okay, we are deporting you and, and suddenly it's a First Amendment issue. And that I could not understand at all. So yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate if you, if you could comment on those two. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those questions. And I will share one other from the audience that came in. So the questioner asks, many prominent universities around the country have recently come under controversy for expelling and suspending non-citizen students who are engaging in protest which has direct consequences for the student's visa status and whether they can stay in the country at all or must leave basically immediately. What role do you think universities, public or private, play in this ecosystem of ideological exclusion and deportation policies and the subsequent enforcement that's involved? What role should universities play? Well, I'm happy to address both the question, uh, thank you for raising it, that you um, raised to me as well as uh, take a stab at this one, as, um, which is a really important and timely question. So in terms of this issue of like, well, if a person, you know, the, the government is coming after someone because they broke a particular law, whether it is murder, as you noted, or broke an immigration law, versus they're coming after that person, they're choosing to select that person of the many people who might fall into that category because of their speech, is in many ways a classic First Amendment question. Um, if you have a person who is, I think the classic example is a, uh, employee of a, a state university and they are not, uh, they're not tenured, there's no, they're a contract person, there's no reason that they have a right to get another year at that university. Um, if they can establish that the reason they didn't get the new contract is for an impermissible constitutional reason, there's, there is a scheme in First Amendment law that allows kind of burden shifting. They, they can prove um, their piece with evidence that the reason I was selected for this was because of my speech. The government has a chance to say, no, we would have done it anyway, and here's why. And that is the classic question that we're just hoping to get to 
in the immigration context. You know, in the case of Ravi and Jean, yes, they had final deportation orders, but as it turns out, at the time, there were 900,000 people in the United States who had final deportation orders with orders of supervision. Those other, you know, 898,000 people were not selected to be deported, just the two who happened to be highly critical of immigration policy in New York City. And that, again, is the classic First Amendment problem. So in the complexities of law, it is a, this kind of scheme where both sides will have their say. But in this context, the government is saying, you don't even get to that. You don't get that far. No one gets to scrutinize why we did this. And that is different than in other First Amendment contexts. On, on the question of universities, I, I do think this is incredibly important. Um, we, during the first Trump administration, um, worked very hard with universities to create policies essentially of welcome, some, some places called them sanctuary university policies, to recognize that the choices that a university makes will have a, a impact on their students who are not US citizens, and they have to be cognizant of that. Um, they are just differently situated. And so when universities are educational institutions, their mission is to help students learn um, and to be part of this discourse. And so they should be aware that if they use um, uh, punishment to respond to uh, protest, uh, to, to speech, that for non-citizens, what might seem like a reasonable response, perhaps a suspension in certain cases for somebody who's repeatedly violated certain rules that are um, designed to strike a balance, if that student faces deportation because of it and cannot be part of the learning environment at all, that is a failure for the university mission, in, in my opinion. And so I think they should be very cognizant of the consequences of their actions and adjust them accordingly. There are other ways to respond to violations of rules that do not involve someone being deported from the United States. Yeah, I'll, I. I can speak just to that the online question as well. I mean, I definitely share your view, uh, Alina. I've been deeply disappointed, um, I would say, by universities in general, and I can speak specifically to, to my institution, you know, the University of California and UCLA in particular, uh, by the extent to which it has repressed just a huge amount of, of student protest activity over the, you know, the war in, in Israel, uh, Gaza, and now wider war. And, um, you know, I think there's a long tradition in kind of blue pro-immigrant states, you could say more generally, of adjusting uh, responses of various kinds to, to different disciplinary activity because of the fact that that disciplinary activity sits atop a, a very draconian and harsh immigration deportation system. It's like California changed a whole load of its laws that used to punish things up to 365 days, for example, to 364 days, because that shift rendered a bunch of conduct, otherwise identical, identically situated conduct, not deportable anymore. You know, I could give you like 100 examples like this, where, where there's very deliberate adjustments that are made to the way um, the state approaches uh, discipline because of the fact that they don't want to kind of become partners to this repressive deportation machine that uh, operates underneath it. And so to me, it just seems like quite obvious um, that you should make similar kinds of adjustments uh, in the context of students. Uh, you know, if you, if you want the students to be able to, to participate in the life of the, the university. Uh, and, and the, the failure to do that, I think, uh, is sort of best understood, I think, as just a piece of a lot of this repressive activity which has happened by uh, the university, not, not just with respect to non-citizens, but also with respect to, uh, to citizen protesters as well. You know, th that being said, I mean, to be clear, like, I actually think if you're going to run a, a, a student visa system, if a student drops out and is, you know, Discipline for you know whatever reasons. Forget the protest activity for 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 a minute. Like it does make sense that under some circumstances the university might have to say like, look, this person's not coming here anymore, and they, you know, we we can't say that they're here on a student visa because they're not really a student anymore. And maybe there might be particularly good reasons for doing that. So I, and to me the idea that that because of that, like I don't have a problem with that system if you're going to run a student visa system. The idea that therefore um, we have to apply that rule with respect to non-citizen students who are in you know, encampments or whatever is, is 
crazy, you know, and it's not really consistent with the way the, at least in California, uh, the state has approached these kinds of questions in a whole bunch of other contexts. Can I just say quickly in, in response to the question? Okay, I have completely failed in my ambitions as a presenter if you were thought that I was saying that everything is protected. What I was saying, I think, what I was trying to say, I guess, because th this is uh, my entire scholarly project, to suggest that in theory, what the First Amendment cases suggest is an incredibly expansive, ambitious, optimistic, democracy forward notion of the range of speech, speakers, speech acts, forms of symbolic communication that should get protection against government regulation. Um, especially in sort of the early dramatic cases, the court seems to be suggesting um, sort of very, very expansive protection for speech of all kinds, including unruly speech, critical speech, embarrassing speech, speech that makes the government look terrible. The First Amendment as a practical matter has never lived up to that promise. And it is the job, I think, of all First Amendment scholars, litigators, and theorists to try and get it to live up to its democratic aspirations. And one of the areas where it has never lived up to that promise and does not live up to that promise today is with the speech of non-US citizens, but not only there. And so I'm sorry if I conveyed the impression that everything is protected. Lots and lots is not. But the idea of the sort of the conception of free speech that is at the heart of the modern First Amendment is a very expansive, uh, optimistic, ambitious idea. Um, and so I think one of the jobs of um, both as a practical matter and as a theoretical matter of litigators and scholars um, and members of the political community is to hold the courts and hold the government feet to the fire. To say, if you want to wrap yourself in this sort of very attractive language of free speech, and if you want to um, use free speech as a way of saying that America is better than other places and what it means to be America, uh, then you have to commit to that vision, which means allowing all this kind of speech that you otherwise don't want to allow. And the courts don't always do that, uh, but uh, that's the job of the critic to keep pushing. Okay, Christian, you get the last word. Well, uh, all I'll say is that just uh, keep an eye out on what your courts are doing. Uh, as, as for me, I'm really just interested in what's going to happen, obviously, with the election, but also with a lot of these doctrines that are still moving through the courts. Uh, I, I tend to look at how the law affects real people, and one group of people that we haven't talked about are those who are in detention, uh, and who very much are also basically deportable, but many of them are not even in detention for having done anything necessarily criminal or uh, something that you would call uh, in violation of the law. The, the immigrant rights movement is, is very broad. It covers many, many folks, many people. And uh, to the extent that you can find one uh, group or one organization that you can get involved with, uh, uh, they, they really need the help. And now with the election, because there's this political fervor, nobody knows what's gonna happen, lots of funding is going to the campaigns, but not necessarily to the organizations. I, I would say to just uh, get involved because that's where the rubber meets the road, that's where uh, you know, all of these doctrines and, and, and these ideas that we're talking about actually come uh, alive and to the extent that you ha can help folks uh, realize the promise of the First Amendment. I think that's one place where uh, we all can be involved and try to uh, make this country the, the more perfect union that we like to say we are. So that's all I'd like to say. That's the perfect place to end this panel. Let's give the panelists a big round of applause.